For our first dialogue of the year, we are, also we are also partnering with the UNCD app on this dialogue. For those of you joining us for the first time, these dialogues focus on the current and relevant topics for insurance supervisors and provide a platform for knowledge and peer exchange. A few housekeeping rules before we begin. Please be aware that this webinar is being recorded and for sound quality, you are muted. For questions, please use the chat box on the right hand side. Should you wish to unmute, please virtually raise your hand or contact the A2I Secretariat. For those of you wishing to access the simultaneous audio translation in French or Spanish, please click the button in the lower left hand side of your screen and select the language you want to listen to. You can adjust the volume in the bar that is shown. Today's webinar is the result of a joint initiative between the A2I and the UNCDF on index insurance. And the first half of this webinar will focus on the UNCDF's Pacific Insurance and Climate Adaption Program, with the second half providing a supervisory perspective on index insurance. To kick things off, I'm pleased to say that we are joined by Manuela Zweimiller, Head of Implementation at the IIS, and our partner in organizing these we webinars. Welcome, Manuela, and please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pascal, uh, for the very kind introduction. So, hello to everyone. Uh, bonjour à tous et buenos dias a todos. Uh, on behalf of the IIS, I'm very happy to welcome all participants to today's joint A2I IIS UNCDF Supervisory Dialogue on Index Insurance Best Practices. It's really great to see so many of you joining interested in this really fascinating and important topics of index insurance. And I'm also very happy to see our renowned speakers for this dialogue lined up. So Krishnan to talk about the UNCDF best practices paper, as Pascal has said, Peter and Caroline, who will give us firsthand insights from a supervisory perspective. As you may know, or as you may remember, at the IIS, we have published an issues paper on index-based insurance, particularly in inclusive insurance market, in June 2018. While this is a couple of years ago, I have to admit this, the key points are still relevant, so I can recommend to read it. In simple words, such index insurance involves contracts where a claim is defined with reference to a predetermined index. This is why we also speak about parametric insurance. So you have a contract here and you have an index there, and then you link the two with each other. That's quite simple. And if the data to determine the index values are produ produced in a timely manner, the claim settlement process should be qu quicker and more objective and thus involve less costs. That would be for the benefit of the policyholder. As such, index insurance should reduce barriers for effective and affordable insurance, also for lower income and more vulnerable groups. It can also be an attractive way to transfer cut event risks to the capital market, which would then facilitate expanding insurability, which is also important if you want to serve a market. Challenges on the other side, the index needs to be very well structured and functional the scheme also needs a high number of clients to maintain a low cost premium and the coverage itself may be narrow for a certain windstorm, for example. Also, index insurance needs quite considerable quantitative experience to properly design the product, to price the risk and to understand them in relation to the index. It's technically complex. We must admit this. As you can imagine, in addition to this necessary analytical capacity, Key challenges are data limitations, lack of sufficiently granular local data, including for time series. Therefore, index insurance may be a challenge with regards to financial literacy, and special attention, attention would be required to explain the risks to policyholders. In conclusion, adequate consumer protection needs to be provided, and clients' needs be reasonably factored into the product design, including the appropriate index to choose. The index really must be credible for all parties. On the other side, on the advantages and recent developments, we have new technologies such as satellite data and images that can accelerate the speed, the spread and the use of the index insurance, for example, in the area of agricultural insurance. So that's really innovation what we are seeing here. 
And index-based insurance is getting more and more prominent, in particular in emerging markets and developing economies. It can provide a quick economic relief when it is most needed, for example, after a natural disaster. This is why we are talking about this very important and equally interesting topic today. With this introductory thoughts, I hand back to Pascal, wishing you an enjoyable and valuable dialogue on index-based insurance best practices. Have fun. Thank you. Thanks, Manuela, for that introduction. And as I touched upon earlier, the A2I and the UNCDF published a joint paper on index insurance best practices for insurance regulators and practitioners. While it does have a focus on the Pacific Island countries, do not let that deter you because it is relevant to insurance regulators globally, precisely because it highlights the advantages of index insurance, but also quite critically the downsides and the considerations that supervisors need to factor in, both from a market conduct and consumer protection perspective, as well as a prudential one. To elaborate um, on Manuela's introduction, we appreciate that not everyone is an expert on index insurance, and we thought we would kick off today with a very brief explanation of what it is and how it works at a very basic level, and also with a slight disclaimer that product design can obviously vary. So using flooding here as an example, the insurer will use modeling and satellite imagery with other data to predetermine flood levels and thresholds. A certain flood depth will trigger a payout, and this payout will depend on the intensity of the hazard. So if you have severe flooding in an area, then the payout will be higher because the impact is bigger. So after the flood has hit, the, insu has hit, the insurer can measure the depth and in turn trigger the insurance coverage. The benefit, as Manuela mentioned, is that the calculation of the hazard can be done very quickly, and subsequently so can the payout. Also, pricing revolves around understanding the frequency and the severity of the hazard. So you can price an estimated loss because your ana analytics have less uncertainty. This can be advantageous, especially in emerging markets, where there can be very little claims data and other data that can help insurers and reinsurers price more accurately. So often um, there is a big uncertainty band around traditional insurance and indemnity covers on risks like this, which, which can make the insurance cover more expensive. But the downside, um, as I mentioned earlier, is the intensity of the hazard triggers the payment. So if, you have, so if you are below that trigger, you could receive nothing. And if you are above the trigger, your predefined payment might not match your actual loss, which is what is often referred to as basis risk. But to go into much more detail on these considerations, um, I will now hand over to Krishnan Narasimhan, who has been leading on the Pacific Insurance and Climate Adaption Program for the UNCDF. Welcome, Krishnan, and over to you. So good morning, good afternoon, uh, 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 like participants, and uh, thank you, Pascal, for the invitation from uh, from to II to participate in this uh, in this dialogue. Uh, thanks also to Manuela for the for for setting the stage. Uh, I'm happy to <coughs> to participate in this dialogue, and also uh, having worked very closely with uh, the A2II team uh, in uh, developing these uh, index insurance best practice uh, guidelines, both for regulators and for industry practitioners, which uh, was published last year, and also uh, we had conducted a workshop uh, jointly. Uh, at the Inclusive Insurance Global Conference in Jamaica. Uh, and uh, we have been receiving very positive feedback on this public, uh, like particular publication. And uh, uh, like, like quite a lot of practitioners have reached out to us. I would also like to acknowledge uh, the contributions of, uh, uh, of Agratosh Mukherjee, I mean, of uh, say Risk Shield Consultants and his team who worked with us in developing this particular publication. Uh, I will not go into full details of the publication because the publication is is, is available online, and I would also request uh, Pascal to share the full the full presentation. I'll just give a background around uh, how we got into developing uh, this particular product. Uh, so 
the context of uh, this program is uh, in the Pacific uh, small island developing states, uh, UNCDF has, uh, has been working for, for quite some time, I would say what nearly 12, 13 years on financial inclusion and uh, access to finance was the core mandate of the earlier program that, uh, uh, that UNCDF was running uh, called the Pacific Financial Inclusion Program. Uh, so even during that time, uh, micro insurance was one of the uh, focus areas or inclusive insurance was one of the focus areas. Given the uh, low uh, insurance penetration in the markets here, and there are other sort of related challenges in these markets being, you know, like relatively uh, poor supply side, uh, like very small markets, uh, scattered uh, like islands, hard to reach populations logistical challenges, infrastructure challenges, uh, so on and so forth. So therefore, we uh, started working uh, with the regional regulators uh, around uh, uh, inclusive insurance overall, because none of these markets uh, had or still have uh, micro insurance regulations. While many of them do have insurance uh, act and uh, subordinate regulations, uh, specifically on uh, micro insurance, there were uh, no regulations. So therefore, uh, in order to uh, uh, develop these markets uh, and UNCDF follows what's called the market systems development approach, where as a development agency, we uh, directly work with the private sector and also with other market players, including the aggregator partners, the regulators, the government, uh, the civil society, etc., to to bring them together in an ecosystem that can lead to the development of innovative solutions and also ensure that uh, last mile is reached. Uh, so this was in this was a few years back when we started working on inclusive insurance. And given the uh, the vulnerability and the climate uh, challenges, uh, most of these countries in the Pacific are highly climate vulnerable. Uh, so every year. Uh, they face two or three big cyclones. Then you have uh, like tsunamis, earthquakes, and other sort of natural hazards that uh, that affect them. Uh, of course, the economic impacts of these are uh, quite heavy, and they have very little uh, technical capacity to cope with these disasters. Uh, there are also uh, limited ex ante instruments that uh, are available uh, uh, for them to uh, to deploy. And usually it's done through deplo uh, through repurposing of uh, government budgets uh, and some countries have uh, like contingent credit and uh, some reserve funds, but uh, not, uh, not, not, not enough to face uh, major events. Uh, so this was the scenario in which, uh, or this was the background in which the Pacific Insurance and Climate Adaptation Program was formed. And uh, this program was uh, started in 2021 January. And given that we started it during the thick of uh, COVID, uh, we had to take an approach where uh, we went in for an inception phase of uh, two years. And then we said that based on the market response and based on how uh, the uh, we move in the market. And also because these were first time ever that uh, uh, like parametric micro insurance was being, was, was being offered in the market. So therefore, uh, we had to establish a business case for the insurance company. Uh, we had to prove that uh, some of our demand studies uh, are validated through actual uh, market responses from clients. And these are uh, market-based solutions with uh, very little subsidy being offered. Uh, so therefore, uh, you, know, you know, you have an economic impact uh, hanging around you, the COVID. And on top of that, uh, these issues were there. And it's, I mean, as I alluded before, none of these markets, none of these regulations uh, are available even today. So how do you get the regulator to approve the products under what conditions? So that's when this particular dialogue uh, with A2II started and we decided to develop uh, what's now uh, resulted into the final publication, which will give a guidance to uh, both the market players and the regulator as to how to proceed further with, with allowing such innovative products to be deployed and at the same time have uh, a focus on consumer protection, have a focus on uh, some sort of prudential supervision 
uh, and at the same time making sure that uh, market conduct is, uh, is, is is sort of ensured. Uh, and right from the beginning, given the challenges in these type of markets, we went in for uh, a digital delivery model. I'll explain to you a little later uh, when we go into the slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the so the program uh, main objective of the program is to improve the financial preparedness of uh, Pacific small island developing states uh, towards uh, towards climate change and natural hazards. It's a climate disaster risk financing and insurance response mechanism to improve uh, local communities resilience against extreme uh, like like climatic events. Uh, the sectors uh, of focus are agriculture, fisheries, tourism and retail uh, with the cross cutting focus on uh, women and uh, people with disabilities. Uh, it also covers MSMEs. Next, please. It's a joint program with uh, UNCDF, uh, the UN Capital Development Fund as the lead agency. Uh, the UN Development Program as an administrative agency, and uh, we also have the UN University uh, uh, based in Bonn, the Institute for Environment and Human Security uh, that hosts the Munich Climate Insurance Initiative as a technical support partner. Next, next please. Uh, the first three countries uh, have been covered, Fiji, Vanuatu, and Tonga in the inception phase during 2021 and 2022. Uh, and the countries that have been included in the expansion phase are the remaining uh, countries that you see on the right, Samoa, Solomon Islands, uh, Kiribati, and uh, Papua New Guinea. Uh, so therefore, uh, by end of this year, this program would be in not less than uh, seven Pacific small island uh, like countries. Plus, uh, also, there is an ambition, and we have started some initial feasibility and scoping studies in a uh, few African countries in the Caribbean as well as uh, in uh, South Asia. Thanks. Next. So, I'll take a while to explain uh, how this ecosystem uh, is put together by UNCDF or by the program. So, this is just uh, an illustration of how we bring the market together. Uh, actually, uh, on I mean, on the extreme left, you you will find uh, the underwriting partners. <clears throat> so we have uh, three underwriting partners. Uh, I mean, across the three countries, uh, Tower is a regional insurer. It's a large insurer from New Zealand, whereas Fiji Care and Sun are local insurers in Fiji and uh, and Vanuatu. Uh, we also have the risk modeling agency that uh, does that works with us in, in actually developing the, the risk models as well as the products. So that's the weather risk management services. Then you have the, uh, the aggregators and the cooperatives. I've just named a few of them. Uh, so the distribution model that has been so far followed is a group distribution model, wherein uh, the, the cooperatives, mainly the agriculture cooperatives or the fisheries cooperatives or the, or the women market vendor cooperatives act as distributors of the insurance product. The product is, actually co-created with the beneficiaries in the sense that based on demand studies the product prototype is developed and it's taken back uh, to the beneficiaries for them to uh, to feed into the product so that's how uh, the cooperatives are also involved in uh, the, the premium collection and they are involved at the time of claim payment in uh, in informing the clients that the claims uh, are due then we also have other ecosystem partners like uh, the fintech players the uh, the digital service providers, the mobile network operators, as well as, of course, the sort of regulators that I spoke about. Uh, and of course, the, the Met offices are very important in terms of uh, uh, the uh, locally sensed data, data provision. So the UNCDF just brings the ecosystem together. And what is unique about UNCDF is uh, it is uh, it, 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 it can it can provide both technical assistance and uh, it can deploy de-risking uh, financial assistance in the form of grants, loans, and guarantees. And this is very important uh, at, at an early stage of market development for the private sector, uh, because if you want private sector to, in, to invest and be involved in the game for a longer duration, then their initial investments have to be de-risked. And that's where uh, these facilities or these unique instruments that uh, UNCDF deploys uh, comes into play. Uh, what next, please? 
Yeah, so this is the portfolio of uh, products that have been developed or supported so far. And you will find that in a short time, based on the market feedback, uh, quite a lot of uh, products have been put into the market. So in Fiji, we have a combined uh, cyclone, uh, wind and rainfall product. Uh, we also have a product for uh, social welfare beneficiaries, which is, uh, which is a specific variant of the earlier product I mentioned. Uh, then there is a product under development, which is shown under color under 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 highlighted text for SMEs. This is uh, this will be launched later this year. Uh, then we have in Vanuatu and Tonga uh, a heavy wind product which covers farmers uh, and households. We also have an EMI product which is under development for the Tonga Development Bank, which should be available uh, later this year. Next. Uh, I'll briefly go through the four work streams that uh, the uh, that UNCDF's program uh, follows. So the work that we have done with Access to Insurance Initiative predominantly comes under work stream one, which is enabling uh, policy and regulation. It's important that uh, the policy regulation uh, environment is is fully enabled, and because there was absence of uh, insurance of micro insurance regulations or index insurance regulations. Uh, this sort of regulatory best practice guideline that was developed with A2II, uh, supported by the Shield and published, was quite useful for the regulator to allow uh, the innovations to be uh, to be deployed in the market uh, using the sandbox. So there's all, there was already a fintech sandbox, and this was the first uh, first application to be allowed under the sandbox. And we are actually exiting the sandbox following uh, fulfillment of all the conditions. <clears throat> So the same uh, same methodology has been used in all the three countries where products have been made available. Uh, I mean, of course, there has been other support from the government in the sense that there has been VAT exemption on the on the premiums. So which means that the cost of uh, the cost of insurance, the cost of premium has actually come down. And this again is uh, thanks to the work that we did very closely with the government and lobbied with the government. Next, please. Yeah. So this is the core of the delivery platform so uh, recognizing the challenges of last mile reach in the pacific islands where there are hard to reach populations in remote islands uh, we went in for a, a digital delivery model so therefore working with fintech partners the first ever uh, digital onboarding platform was created which uh, works on tablets laptops uh, and also mobile phones which is used uh, both by the by the insurance company staff and by the by the aggregator staff, by the cooperatives, for uh, collecting uh, data from the beneficiaries at the field level, which also ensures capture of uh, live uh, location data, which is very, very important in index insurance. Uh, and the data is seamlessly transferred from the field. Uh, it can work both online and offline. And when it comes to uh, network area, it is automatically transferred uh, to the back end of the insurance company, which then goes in for underwriting and uh, and issuing of uh, certificates of insurance after the premium is collected. Uh, we have also enabled uh, digital payments, which means that premium collection can be done digitally and the claim payments can be done through e-wallets uh, directly to the beneficiary. Next, please. So uh, the, the product innovation has been, like I said, there are multiple products available in the market to suit uh, the different segments. And uh, in a very short time, I would say that uh, the revised product, which is the combined rainfall and uh, wind product uh, in Fiji was launched in August 2022. And by the time the cyclone season started here in uh, October, November of 2022, and we are right now in the midst of a cyclone season, uh, a total of uh, uh, 2000 plus uh, households have been covered uh, so far by the market-based product. Uh, what's important is uh, in, in this market-based product, the premium is not subsidized. The premium is paid uh, by the individual. Uh, and uh, you know this is because of the various partnerships that have, been, uh, uh, that have been established. And I mentioned to you about the ecosystem that has been developed. Yeah. There's also this macro to micro product, which covers the most vulnerable groups. In this case, there are 2,000 households uh, under the social welfare. Uh, this was also a big uh, improvement from the 274 of the previous year. And the ambition is to increase this further to about 10,000 households during the current year. 
we have also established partnerships with un women to reach most most vulnerable women and this work with uh, undrr uh, which is happening right now in terms of linking climate risk insurance with anticipatory action you will hear more about it uh, from us during the course of this year next please yeah so uh, what is what is important is that how does this ecosystem uh, works or how has it worked so far <clears throat> Now, uh, up to the onboarding of customers, the numbers are uh, quite impressive from the short period that have been there. But the proof uh, uh, is actually there only when the claims have to be paid out. So uh, following the heavy rains in the first uh, couple of weeks in January this year uh, in the Western region of Fiji, uh, the first ever uh, sort of trigger uh, happened. And following that, uh, approximately, uh, not, I mean, not approximately, exactly 530 five uh, individuals were eligible for a payout so if you just want me to give a, a timeline uh, the confirmed weather data for the first fortnight of uh, uh, january was made available by the met office uh, on the 19th uh, to the uh, to the risk modeler or the, to the index monitor the data was analyzed and in 24 hours time uh, by the 20th the data was uh, uh, was analyzed and uh, it was it 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 was uh, 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 like desired that 535 individuals who were in the uh, in the proximity of uh, the weather stations which was covered by the product were eligible for a payout and the list of beneficiaries was shared with the insurance companies on the 21st and the insurance companies did a verification of uh, the wallets and the bank accounts uh, of uh, the of the members and all the payouts had been done in about 10 days time so by end of the month uh, i think by 29th or 30th of uh, january all the 535 individuals had got payouts into their mobile wallets a few of them into their bank accounts uh, and this actually has established a very solid proof of concept that uh, once an ecosystem is created and it's enabled uh, through appropriate uh, supportive uh, regulatory framework, in this case, the sandbox, uh, and also backed by uh, a strong digital distribution model and a digital payment ecosystem model, then uh, the whole ecosystem works. Uh, next, please. Yeah, this is some of the feedback that we have received from a few of the beneficiaries who received uh, payments. And uh, this was a phone uh, interview done with them just a couple of days after the payments were made. Detailed uh, personal interviews are going to be done uh, uh, by the team uh, later this month. Uh, so most of them did say that uh, this was the first, first payment. This was the only payment that they received. They didn't receive any government assistance or, or, or any assistance from NGOs. So therefore, they were quite, quite happy with uh, the payouts. Next, please. <clears throat> Yeah, so this will be my last slide. So uh, in a in a very uh, difficult product or in a very abstract product like this, where you know unless a payout happens, people don't really start believing uh, the power of insurance or the potential of insurance. Uh, the education or the financial literacy is very very important. Uh, and in this case, uh, what UNCDF uh, through this program has done is to capacitate our delivery partners. In this case, both insurance companies as well as uh, the distribution partners so uh, in the in the in, in the in the two years that has been completed about 61 such capacity building initiatives uh, like covering 451 staff uh, was done and through them of course the market is reached the beneficiaries are reached so a total of uh, 22186 participants have been reached and that's probably one of the reasons why the uptake is also quite high basically because uh, of the awareness that has been created in the market of the of the importance of insurance that has been established and as i said before uh, we have uh, laid a very uh, strong foundation and this has been uh, 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 like thanks to all the partners of course the donors have been very supportive uh, this program uh, gets its uh, support from the governments of australia new zealand uh, India and Luxembourg. So I would like to thank all of them for the support of the program. And as the program expands, we'll also keep you informed and updated as to how this program is expanding. I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions uh, later on. Thanks.
Thanks, Christian. Uh, Craig, thanks, Christian, for that outline of the program, and we look forward to hearing more about it as it develops further. Just for participants to be aware, there are links to both the UNCDF and IIS pen papers mentioned by Manuela, Krishnan, and myself in the chat. Also, for those of you wanting to look over Krishnan's slides in more detail, we will be sharing the slides again at the end of this webinar. I can see that questions are already coming through the chat, um, and we will address these at the end, so please bear with us. Um, in the meantime, I will now hand over to Caroline Wagabaka from the Central Bank of Fiji, who are participating in the UNCDF program and who will outline their experience with index insurance from a supervisory perspective. Bula and warm greetings from the Reserve Bank of Fiji. I'm Caroline Wangabata, Head of the Financial System Development Team that assists with development work on inclusive insurance in the bank. It gives me great pleasure to share with you our experiences and insights in this area, and I express our gratitude to Access to Insurance Initiative, International Association of Insurance Supervisors, and the United Nations Capital Development Fund for the opportunity to share on this platform. As introduction, Fiji as a small island developing state is susceptible to natural disasters or hazards, which are increasing in frequency and intensity as a result of climate change and has limited capacity to manage its climate risks. Managing climate related risks through climate financing is neither cheap nor easy to set up. Estimates show that reducing Fiji's climate vulnerability would cost us US $4.5 billion over 10 years. And if we were to maintain status quo, the cost would be around US 250 million annually, which is around 5% of our GDP. Despite our high exposure, a lot of our people have little financial protection against climate risk disasters. Notwithstanding other financial options available, recent collaboration between the Reserve Bank and key stakeholders have provided an insurance solution linked to risk reduction and preventative activities as a means to reduce the cost of damages from climate change and disasters. Today I will share about our partnership with government, the financial sector, UNCDF, Pacific Insurance and Climate Adaptation Program, and the governments of Australia, India, and New Zealand on the introduction of a parametric insurance for Fiji, which is the first of its kind in the Pacific region. On the introduction of a parametric insurance for Fiji, it was necessary to look at our regulatory framework, which would enable the implementation of the new product and more broadly ensure that this new development would support financial and macroeconomic stability. Under our Insurance Act and the bank supervision policy for insurance, all insurance companies in Fiji, prior to introducing any new product or enhancing an existing one, must get reserve bank approval. So under these legislative requirements, the bank approved the parametric insurance product, which it considered as another general insurance product. In addition, the new product also met the eligibility criteria for experimentation in the FinTech regulatory sandbox to further understand parametric insurance as a new product in the market. The sandbox, which exists to facilitate testing of FinTechs, was developed as a guideline issued in December 2019 and currently accommodates four other solutions, including new types of payment solutions and personal financial management applications. So what are the processes associated with our regulatory sandbox? Fiji's sandbox guidelines uh, were launched in 2019 to encourage the wider adoption of innovative solutions to foster development and improve managing risks associated with financial stability and consumer protection. There are four stages in the sandbox process. The preliminary stage, which involves determining entities that are potentially suitable for sandbox testing according to a documented eligibility criteria. The preparation stage involves closely collaborating with the potential entities identified in the preliminary stage to determine sandbox conditions, which, are, which can include meeting fundamental obligations relating to adequate resources, compliance with relevant laws, redress mechanisms and an exit strategy. The experimentation stage involves the testing of the solution by the entity within the approved time in accordance with the sandbox conditions. Experimentation allows the bank to collect insights into the performance of the new product 
and business model that would otherwise be difficult to determine in abstract. And at the final exit and transition stage, depending on the solution, the bank will inform the sandbox entity of any specific regulatory or policy requirements that it would be subject to once it exits based on the outcomes of the testing. Now moving on to our parametric insurance solution in the sandbox, in June 2021, the bank received an application from PCAP, which was in partnership with two local underwriters and two fintech companies to test its parametric insurance product in the sandbox. At the preliminary stage, the bank assessed the parametric insurance uh, product was a novel one for the Fiji market with characteristics unlike those of traditional indemnity type insurance contracts. It also had potential to exp expand insurance coverage and enhance resilience for the underserved communities in the face of extreme weather conditions. The proposed solution is supported by two fintechs, as earlier mentioned, which enabled an electronic platform for reading, recording, onboarding beneficiary details, and a weather data and calculating agency. Payouts to beneficiaries of predefined amounts are triggered by specific wind speed and rainfall indicators associated with a cyclone and depends on proximity to its center. At the preparation stage, the bank observed the parametric insurance pilot within a small group of beneficiaries to further examine any risks or issues relating to management of customer satisfaction and perceptions of insurance linked to inherent basis risks, as well as technology-related incidents that would materially impact the, out the pilot outcomes and disbursement payout to beneficiaries. In October 2021, the bank approved the admission of PCAP and its partners to pilot their parametric insurance product with selected agri-based cooperatives across Fiji for a period of 12 months, subject to seven agreed conditions. These conditions covered the capture of qualitative data from policyholders to gauge the use and satisfaction with the product and impact on risk attitudes and behaviors, how to address technology-related incidents, ensuring the successful disbursement of payouts, and conducting financial literacy training and awareness activities to adequately inform beneficiaries about the product and its risks. And in the experimentation stage, the bank conducted two assessments on progress of the solution against the agreed conditions. The assessments were done at the six and 12 month terms of the pilot. The bank was able to identify gaps and opportunities to manage key risks and key issues that may impact on the outcome of the pilot. And following its admission into the sandbox, PCAP successfully conducted training for aggregators and key stakeholders awareness sessions for over 7,000 beneficiaries, and we have, they've introduced new product variants as a response to customer feedback. In terms of underlying technology, the bank was satisfied with performance uh, with no material incidents, while some areas of improvement required in terms of establishing partnerships with relevant meteorological agencies for reliable and timely data to inform quicker disbursements. There were no complaints received during the pilot, However, based on queries by beneficiaries, there was a need to improve awareness on the intricacies of the predefined payout schedule in order to appropriately manage beneficiaries' expectations during major weather events. And at the end of the testing period in November 22, PCAP had satisfactorily met most of the sandbox conditions, but there was no trigger event yet to provide end-to-end -end testing of the weather data and calculating agency and its integration with underwriters and mobile money payment service providers responsible for the disbursement into wallets. As a result, the uh, insurance solution was complied with most of the agreed conditions, while an extension of the testing period for six months up to May uh, 2023 was granted for further observation. In January this year, heavy rainfall over six day period, particularly in the Western Division of the country, resulted in a trigger event and a payout of around US $44,000 to 525 beneficiaries, of which 41% were women and 38% were persons living with disabilities. So what are some lessons learned and key takeaways uh, we have from this experience? One, 
It's acknowledging that climate and disaster risk financing, such as parametric insurance, is still a relatively new subject, which we bankers and financial sector players do not have expertise in. So we need to build knowledge and capacity and create more awareness about it amongst ourselves and stakeholders. Two is that the take up of um, parametric insurance and innovative solutions takes time and does not occur overnight due to reluctance by consumers and their lack of awareness of the products offered. And three, from our experience, we've also learned that piloting innovative solutions such as parametric insurance may take a longer than expected duration. And this duration depends on how and when the product or solution meets these sandbox conditions. Such modifications, as in our case of the parametric insurance, were necessary to understand the solution impact on the risk profile of the institution, especially since it was a new product for Fiji and the Pacific. Three takeaways we have from this experience are one, that communication is key to ensure that expectations are clear and met. We must all be on the same page. As regulators, we need to ensure that sandbox entities understand their role in order to comply with conditions and reporting requirements. Two, that effective collaboration amongst relevant stakeholders is important, so we are able to successfully design appropriate products, which would be sustainable in the long term. And three, given that sandbox solutions impact the lives and livelihoods of the wider population, that financial literacy for consumers is critical, so they fully understand these new financial products and services. And to conclude, we wish to make three points. First is that more concerted effort is needed to advance climate financing work. Progress so far has been positive, but more work is needed. Two, that more strategic partnerships and a collaborative approach uh, are required to develop practical policies and guidelines aligned to development objectives. As policymakers, we must lead this positive change and pave the way for the industry. In this connection, the Reserve Bank remains a committed partner through its financial inclusion efforts in supporting innovation via our sandbox ecosystem, which has allowed the introduction of innovative solutions in the market. And three, the pilot parametric insurance product has demonstrated the growing interest and demand for such solutions by even the most vulnerable sections of the population. This product was purchased by at least 1,300 target beneficiaries across Fiji in 2021 and this increased to around 2,000 in 2022. The need to strengthen our efforts towards finding other appropriate micro and meso level climate risk insurance products are clear. This will bring about a positive impact on people through reduced borrowing, safeguarding savings and investments, and also especially lowering our dependency on limited government funds to recover from the impact of climate related events. The Reserve Bank would be happy to share more information on our experience. We hope this presentation today has been informative and we thank you all for listening. I'm pleased to say that our next speaker is with us and I would like to welcome Peter Okongo from the Regulatory Authority of Uganda. Keen followers of the A2I will know that Uganda participated in our dialogue on index insurance back in 2021 and they are back by popular demand due to their level of experience and expertise on index insurance. So Peter, no pressure, um, and over to you. Welcome and over to you. We'll get your slides up shortly as well. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you, A2II. Thank you to IAISS and you and CDF for inviting us for this dialogue. It's a pleasure for us to be here. As I said, we were here in 2021. We, it's a pleasure for us to come back to this platform and share our experience. Uh, as, oh, sorry, I can't, I can't move that slide. Maybe you help me move it. Yes, the next one. Oh, sorry. Just tell me what yeah, the slide, yeah. Okay, all right. Yes, I think it would be better for us to talk about our vision, mission, but I think for now, let us focus on the main reason why we are here. 
I'm going to share with you our experience on agriculture in index insurance, which is one of the, the index insurance we've, we've, we've launched in the market. The index insurance in Uganda, it started way back in, uh, sorry, uh, it started, the next slide, please. Yeah, sorry, our index insurance started way back in 2011, which was an idea originated from three players, namely Lion Assurance, APA, UAP. These players came up with these ideas basing from the fact that some of their sister companies were offering these products. So a case in point, UAP and APA, the sister companies in Kenya were offering these products in Kenya. Lion Assurance being uh, having an origin or originates from Zimbabwe, they got the product from there, brought it to Uganda and um, requested the regulator to approve it. So the product was approved. And as you, the previous slide, we received our first, our first photo of index insurance. Maybe just go back to the previous slide. Now there, as you're saying, that was the first photograph taken in Uganda for index insurance. And uh, initially it was named, it was given a local name so that the product could, the public could associate with the product. In Uganda here we named it Kungula, which means in our local nativity means to harvest. Meaning the company understood the market, the challenges they were facing as they were doing their farming practices and came up with a solution which would enable them to harvest what they had planted. And hence, they introduced what we call weather index insurance. You can see the regulator, it, the CEO, IRA in the middle, the other side was the CEO insurance. That one is Lion Assurance launching the product. The next slide. Yes, as I said, it was the product was launched in 2011. Then a pilot, a pilot began with the UNDP in partnership with UNDP in few districts of Kamuli and Kayunga. Here they were only covering weather index insurance. Now in these two districts, they were mainly covering specific crops to see that uh, this product works. And yeah, if I remember properly, the crops which were covered were mainly beans and um, and maize. In 2016, uh, during the pilot, sorry, during the pilot, we had mainly weather index insurance and around 2015, 2015, 14, we also had another pilot on area yield index insurance, which was uh, done in partnership with one acre fund. And this one here, the, the the pilot was carried out in another district called Buyukwe, whereby farmers were involved in maize. This one here, the, the target crop was mainly maize. Uh, it was uh, basically be, the partnership was between um, one acre fund and uh, Munich Re. They, they did the pilot. Thereafter, they come up with products which were submitted to the authority again for approval. The authority approved it and, and hence the product started adding the market. Well, during the, the, the process of uh, piloting, uh, the partners experienced all the underwriters experienced challenges. And some of the challenges were the public or the, the farmers could cry that insurance, agriculture insurance was expensive. So in so doing, in partnership with the insurance regulatory authority, the insurance players now lobbied for support from government and in 2016 uh, the government offered premium subsidy to agriculture insurance so every financial year from 26 financial 2016 2017 government committed finance to support farmers in terms of in paying their premium in form of subsidy next slide yes uh so after that then um uh, in 20, 2020, 2017, Insurance Act was ratified and development of regulations commenced. And one of the regulations which were developed therein was the index contract, index insurance regulations, which came into force in 2020. 
and the key highlights of the the index insurance were first of all how to define an index insurance as you've rightly said very few people would understand the definition of this index insurance if i'm to ask around everyone ideally have their own definition of index insurance but the regulation came up to make sure that there is uh the definitions are streamlined the process of product approvals uh for products which are best index insurance were streamlined and players were encouraged to submit their products for approval the com product approval committee was also formed by the authority in order to support implementation of this yeah the regulation also stipulated the kind of data required to support the the design of of this index insurance and uh, also the regulation clearly stipulated that how the payout will be determined and within what timeline so the the regulation also clarifies on the how often the policies should be reviewed as you we we shall all agree that the index insurance the the parameters keep on changing here and there so the regulations also provides for periodic review of the products which is being done by the authority next slide yes so in this when government when the public the, when the public complaint of the high premium rate the insurance companies in partnership with the insurance regulator authority they lobbied for premium subsidy from government and as i told you in the previous slide in 2016 the government formed public private partnership whereby government subsidizes premium to farmers for farmers and the private farms which are the insurance companies offer cover now to administer this there are partners which are who are involved in this particular arrangement and one of them being the regulator who's the here in we are talking about the insurance regulatory authority and their major mandate is to come up with regulations oversee the activities of the, the the companies who are participating in agriculture insurance and also in, ensure that the those farmers who are entitled to the subsidy they are verified and the subsidy list submitted to the ministry is correct now there are a number of insurance companies now after the the pilot some other players picked interest and they wanted to join and most especially when the PPP was formed with the government of Uganda. Other players now wanted to come in, which was allowed. So the, the PPP was formed between the government of Uganda and insure, Uganda Insurers Association. So Uganda Insurers Association being an association of insurance companies, they hired an, the experts or they, they outsourced the service of um, doing the administrative work to agro consortium they formed a consortium of insurance companies so all the insurance companies who are, who are willing to offer agriculture insurance they formed a consortium which which sits at uia uia is the uganda agriculture insurance consortium so the consortium's work is mainly to offer the technical expertise here they do marketing underwriting and also pay pay claims on behalf of the the insurers they offer take ideally they offer technical support to to the players offering this now when they get the farmers they submit they they recruit farmers those who are buying insurance the farmers pay their portion of premium they get that list submit to the insurance to the insurance regulatory authority for review and submission to 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 the minister of finance now insurance regulatory authority reviews the the subsidy list submitted by AIC. AIC is the Agriculture Insurance Consortium. After confirming that the share of farmers submitted are correct, then they forward it to Minister of Finance, who then verifies it and authorizes Bank of Uganda to pay premium subsidy to AIC, who then distributes this premium to respective insurance companies. So it has there are basically four partners in this in in this uh, partnership and each of them has its own role which they play diligently next slide
Yes, uh, so IRA plays, uh, as I said, we, the private public partnership, which was formed, there are different stakeholders and IRA being one of them, there are specific roles which are played by IRA in this. So what IRA does is to ensure that the agricultural insurance products offered to the market are fit for the market. And uh, here what it does is that it, do, it, it does the review and approval of these products. There's a committee which has been set up whose main role is mainly to, to review all the products submitted to, submitted to the authority for, for, for approval before the products are, sub, are released out there. And one of the key things which the committee looks out for is to ensure that the, the submitted products indeed answers some of the key concerns in the public. Does it answer the needs of the public or it is just something which someone is coming up with to make, to, to make money? And I can assure you the authority has rejected some of the products which they deem not fit for the public and approve those which they feel or think it will answer the concerns which are out there in the, in the public. And the other thing is they conduct the verification of the underwritten insurance policies submitted by AIC. When AIC submits the, sheet, the schedule, they don't just get it and forward to the ministry. They verify it and ensure that indeed the, the information provided to them is true and the farmers provided I indeed they are farmers, not just uh, half cooked or, or just cooked figures. They also advise Bank of Uganda and Ministry of Finance on the amount of premium subsidy due for payment to, to AIC. As I said, AI, IRA plays a critical role in this and uh, them being the regulator of insurance, they understand the market much better. So they up advise government on all the insurance related matters and in this particular case the amount of subsidy to be paid the amount of uh premium subsidy to be paid to aic has to be verified and approved by the authority before the ministry can do it can go ahead and and pay we also do effective monitoring of the uh monitoring of the uptake and ensure that the scheme does not commit government uh, beyond the budgetary allocation now here every year, as I said, the government allocated from 2016, financial 2016, 2017, government allocated uh, 5 billion, UGX 5 million, 5 billion per financial year. But there are times whereby, like, as we speak, this when, when the AIC or the players started sensitizing farmers or creating awareness, the market welcomed the product. Very many people bought the product and sometimes they are, there are times whereby the subsidy, uh, the number of people who subscribe for insurance under this arrangement exceeds the subsidy the government committed. So one of the IRA's mandate is to, or role in this arrangement is to ensure that the amount of subsidy requested for falls within the 5 billion which the government committed. And at no time shall the player submit a list with more, uh, subsidy than the amount which was committed. Uh, next. Yes, so the other thing which I meant to, to share with you is the impact. I remember uh, uh, Krishna said that um, IRA we presented in 2011, Pascal talked about that, but from then we've had a number of impacts from the point when uh, the scheme, the private uh, the public private partnership was formed. We've seen uh, increased household income. Here, what happened is that people used to be plant their crops. At the end of the season, they, 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 they harvest nothing as a result of, uh, of, of drought or excessive rainfall. But ever since the scheme came into to effect, we realized that uh, people are able to have some revenue. I mean, at the someone plants and at the end of the season, God forbid if well, they were hit by the insured peril 
or insured risks then when insurance company compensates them you find that they they are able to have some income and they they invest it in some other thing or do something some people have constructed houses others have taken their children to school and now we are seeing people continuing with 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 uh, with farming banks are also now able to we've we've also lobbied through partner we've lobbied with the banks and they are now able to accept agriculture insurance as a security and to support for 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 scheme you see initially agriculture farm banks used to if you're a farm and you're going to borrow money banks used to ask for collateral they ask you for 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 probably land title maybe if you 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 have a house they ask you for for the details of your house you put it as a security but as we speak banks use agriculture insurance policies to to support or to act as collateral for for farmers to get to get loans something which is really very good so that even someone without any serious asset can now access finances we we've also seen that uh, the banks have also reduced their interest rates because you see the higher the risk the higher the interest rate so because the insurance is there now to hedge insurance has offered guarantee that should the insured event occurs say maybe uh, you lose your a farmer loses their crops as a result of drought or excessive rainfall then the insurance company will be able to come in and um, come in and respond or, or compensate the, the bank or repay back the loan which this bank lent to, to, to the individual. So what has happened now, the banks have lowered their, their, their interest rate because of that, that guarantee from, from insurance company. From the start, uh, we, we had very few farmers, but as we speak now, we, we have over 3,750 sorry 300 750 thousand farmers who have utilized agriculture insurance and majority of these are small scale farmers now here small scale farmers we mean someone who's planting in less than five acres of land they are those with a half an acre two acres those with five two acres they are the majorities who are enjoying this agriculture insurance so we've seen that and uh, from I'm off, but yeah, am I still on, Pascal? Yes, we can still hear you, Peter. Okay, yeah, so as I was saying that uh, the number of uh, uptake in agriculture insurance has also increased. As we speak now, we have over 375,000 farmers who have utilized agriculture insurance. And as I said, the their, their, their household income has greatly increased. Let's go to the next slide. Has greatly increased because they are able to have um, they are able to have some some money should the insured even if they don't harvest, then they have a backup from the insurance company at the end of the the season. We've also lobbied with the government. Uh, the progress made ever since from that time. You see, agri agriculture insurance or index insurance. The target here is to that to target the target group here we are looking at the small holder or the small scale farmer people who are using uh, less than five acres of land and now here initially government used to to charge vat which is uh, vat on all the insurance companies but with the help of ira we've lobbied for government we've lobbied with the government and they have removed vat from agriculture insurance that is one big progress we've made the other one is also government has also been able to remove the stamp duty they're able to hear me uh, government has been able to to remove the stamp duty which used to be charged per policy we used to charge thirty five thousand per policy on now that has also been removed uh the other thing also we've the pilot initially the the initial the subsidy pilot was meant to to last for five years but uh, the good news is the good news is that now from the five years from 2016 2017 it it ended 
and uh, the good news is that the pilot has been extended for another four years. So we are making some good progress in the Hi, Peter, we can no longer hear you. Can you hear me, Peter? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Please go ahead. Ah, where well, did we stop? Um, you just explained that the product that the um the project has been extended for another four years. Okay. Yes, the program, the project, the pilot has been extended for another four four years because what we found out is that uh, the people we are dealing with these are small scale farmers, people who had they they do. Uh, from the garden to to, to 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 their mouth, from garden to mouth, they don't have any other source of revenue apart from this. So what happened is that we lost it due to the the overwhelming interest from the public, and there's, yet there are some areas which we had not reached. We managed to convince the government and extend the pilot for another extra four years, which has now commenced. Uh, uh, agriculture insurance premium has also increased for the in the first uh, even with the subsidy we we registered uh, a premium worth five billions but as we speak now the premium for last year that is 2020 we we ended the year when agriculture insurance had registered 73 billions this is a very big achievement from our side the authority has also been able to review the index insurance policies in a periodic manner. Every period we request those people to submit the products for review. And this has been missing very well. Next slide. Yes, any successful thing has got challenges. So we've had a number of challenges and one of them being limited number of specialists in agriculture insurance more especially when it comes to to, to risk and uh, claims adjustment as you say that uh, the association gave the response the mandate to the consortium they formed a consortium to get expertise to handle this but the number of employees there they are just a handful so the industry needs also specialized people in agriculture insurance to offer adjustments Yes, uh, in, in our culture or community, women take good care of the families. And uh, in most cases, they are the ones in charge of food. Now, agriculture insurance, the design was this, what the index insurance was to, to, to attract women to come up and protect, to ensure that we have food security. But unfortunately, the number of women turning up, there is a lot attendance of women when it comes to uh, training, more especially on uh, agriculture insurance. So that has been a big challenge. Also, the other challenge we're having is the basis risks. This has also been a big challenge on our side because when a scenario whereby you insured a specific peril, it occurred and indeed the, the garden, someone's garden was destroyed uh, as a result of these specific perils. But the monitoring result says there's no, the monitoring result which relies on the design of the product says there's no payout. So that has been a challenge from our side, but we've continuously engaged the players to, to see that they improve on their, their products so that it depicts what is on ground. Oh, climate change, climate, climate, climate. It has been a very big challenge. And um, because of its unpredictability, you realize that uh, whether best or index insurance, the the premium rate has been increasing here and there because the insurers are trying to 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 mark up and and adjust so that they are able to to the premium they charge is sufficient for them to cover the risk. So this the adjustment in the 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 premium rate has really affected the the. The, the rise in what? In uh, premium. 
Sorry. Are you able to hear me? We can hear you, Peter. Um, but in the essence of time, Peter, I, I think we need to move on to the question and answer session, if you don't mind. Just because, as always, we are slightly running over. Um, and we've received quite a few questions, actually, in the chat box. Um, so actually, if you don't mind, Peter, we'll move to the Q&A session because you have one question in itself and, and Krishnan has two. No problem. Thank you. Thank you for understanding. All right. Um, so Krishnan, if you don't mind, we'll start uh, with the question for Peter. Um, Peter, in the Ugandan index insurance scheme, do both bank and insurer underwriters embedded in their underwriting guidelines positive discrimination of farming systems that protect biodiversity and are high carbon sinks such as agroforestry ones considering that they also reduce exposure to a number of agricultural insurable perils such as flood, landslide, flood, fire and strong winds etc. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Yes, I can say yes, if they are embedded in, but the only challenge is usually the, the agroforestry, most of the people who are involved in it, they, they demand for extra perils to be covered. They, they, are, they demand for extra perils to be covered, and uh, when they ask for that, then the product offered now shifts from index insurance to multi-peril. So because of their size, in most cases, we, we offer them uh, multi-peril cover. While for banks, uh, yes, we do offer them index insurance. Thank you. Thanks, I Peter. Thank you, and thanks for keeping your answer concise as well. That's much appreciated. Um, Krishnan, uh, we have two questions for you. Um, that came in earlier. Um, the first question is, are these models, I think this is referring to the portfolio of products that you outlined on slide 15, are these models already contemplating climate change? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. So in fact, uh, when the product development was done and the, and the historical weather data was analyzed to, uh, to arrive at the, at the indexes and the trigger design, uh, nearly 40, 40 plus years of uh, rainfall data and the wind data was analyzed uh, across multiple countries. And uh, given the frequency of uh, extreme weather events having increased, at least in the last decade, as we saw from the data, uh, we did uh, multiple uh, like scenario modeling, including, uh, I mean, averages of, uh, I mean, average of averages. So instead of just taking last 40 years or 30 years data, uh, it was done on an average of last 10 years plus last 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. So the final model that was done, and especially in terms of premium fixing, uh, part of it, most of it has been factored, but however, you know, I mean, we all know that uh, uh, like uh, the impact of climate change, at least as evidenced by uh, the changing weather patterns and the rainfall patterns, as well as uh, unseasonal uh, extreme weather, uh, is an evolving science. And uh, while we have factored these into uh, the product design so far, we will have to be looking at these on a regular basis in terms of uh, revisiting the design and the premium structure, etc., going forward. Thanks. Thanks, Krishnan. And we do have another question for you in the chat. Um, is the SME parametric insurance product um, social protection or business case microinsurance? Have you done research on the willingness to pay for premium? Does the program yeah. have a subsidy? Yeah. So, uh, so there are uh, two uh, two types of covers. One is, of course, for the farmers and others, which is more of a business interruption or a loss loss, uh, a loss of income type of uh, plan, uh, which is uh, market-based, which means that uh, the premiums are paid uh, by the beneficiary. Then the social protection actually covers uh, people who are in the welfare system. Uh, 
people who are uh, in one of the categories of the welfare system. It could be uh, old age pensions, it could be persons with disabilities, it could be uh, uh, single mothers who are eligible for uh, the monthly subsistence payments or, uh, you know, there are four categories of uh, welfare beneficiaries. So for the welfare beneficiaries, uh, uh, the government is uh, paying through budget support. So the premiums are subsidized. Of course, the product is slightly different. The product is not the same product as is given to the regular market uh, in the regular market. This has been designed uh, with a view to provide uh, the welfare beneficiaries with a monthly payment in the happening of an extreme in like event equivalent to what they were getting as a uh, monthly pension or a monthly payment otherwise. So this would be linked to uh, their welfare payments, but it would be uh, through an insurance mechanism for which the premiums are subsidized. Thanks. Thanks. And um, unfortunately, um, I'm going to have to wrap that up because we have run out of time. Uh, but yeah. we will keep the chat open and we will try to answer those questions that we have not had time to address. I apologize for that. Thank you once again to our excellent speakers, Krishnan and Peter, for taking the time to join us today. Thanks also to Caroline and her team at the Central Bank of Fiji. I apologize for problems with the recording, and we will make that recording available to all the participants. Also, many thanks to our partners for this dialogue, the UNCDF and the IIS. Thank you as well to our participants. Um, before you go, if you could quickly answer the question that will pop up on your screen. This is part of the A2I's monitoring and evaluation, and we welcome your feedback. Our next dialogue will be a supervisory one taking place on the 25th of May on the IIS's work on diversity, equality, and inclusion. We look forward to seeing you then. And in the meantime, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>